Actually, what happened was a promoter came to me and he said he had the uh, fairgrounds for a day and uh, he wanted us to close the show and he offered us a, a really good sum of money to close the show and then he was going to like build acts around us, you know, for a, a day-long festival. And so that night uh, I was uh, asleep and I woke up and I thought to myself, why should we just, you know, do this one isolated show for a fee? Why don't we just get artists from all over the world? I had this like global vision, you know, of uh, getting people from all over the world to come and uh, give them no fee. <laughs> and take no fee ourselves and just put it together and uh, form the Monterey Pop Foundation. But by morning, I'd expanded it to an entire weekend rather than just one day. And uh, I, called, uh, I called Lou Adler first. And I, I explained it to Lou what I, what I thought we could do, you know. And he said, you're crazy, go back to sleep, you know. <laughs> and then uh, he called me back and said, you know, that's a pretty good idea after all. Maybe we should, maybe we should do that. And uh, so then we put together a steering committee of uh, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Lou Adler, Terry Melcher, myself, Paul Simon. I think there are about nine people on it. Everybody uh, put in seed money of uh, $10,000 each. They put that money in the bank, and that was to come back out of first profits from the festival. And with that money, we started off uh, festival offices on Sunset Boulevard and started making phone calls around the country and around the world. And uh, no one said no. It was the most amazing thing. Uh, we told them that all they get is uh, plane fare from where they were to Monterey and expenses while they were there and plane fare to their next job and that was it and uh, they had to give up recording rights and film rights and it was all going to charity for young musicians they all said okay fine we'll be there <laughs> and there were no contracts involved or you know no, no, no release forms until they arrived and nothing was done in advance as far as uh, contractual things so in fact with Otis I talked to Phil Walden uh, who was uh, in charge of his record company th at that time, the one Otis was recording for, and was, was also Otis's personal manager. I explained the concept to him, and uh, he said, uh, yeah, we'd like to do that, we'd like to be there. And he said, uh, let me talk to Otis, I'll call you back tomorrow. So he called me back the next day, and he said, uh, now what plane should we take? <laughs> so I said, well, I don't know yet, I'll call you back. So I, I called him back with this uh, flight schedule, and he said, okay, we'll see you then. This was about, you know, two months before the festival. So uh, and I didn't hear from them again. I couldn't reach them. They were on the road, and uh, we kept missing connections. So I showed up at the airport at that flight, and they got off the plane. <laughs> you know, and the whole thing just sort of worked that way. It was like magic. It was uh, everyone showed up, and everyone got along. And uh, the town of Monterey, of course, was going crazy because of uh, you know it's a community of 200,000 people, and we were expecting half a million visitors, you might say, <laughs> that we had that weekend uh, with long hair and wild eyes. As it turned out, there wasn't even one arrest that weekend. And the townspeople of Monterey were fantastic, and they opened their homes and uh, fed people, and people slept on lawns. And suddenly the city realized that uh, it was really a celebration, and uh, they opened up all the public facilities, the football fields for people to camp out on, and, uh, and uh, the parks and all that kind of thing. You know, So that spirit of cooperation carried through the whole thing. Well, she was so nervous uh, that it was crazy. She had her Southern Comfort bottle and uh, she was backstage and uh, we were all telling her it would be fine, it'll be fine, don't worry about a thing, you know. And she was rattling, like, like you know, just shaking. And uh, as soon as she hit the stage, uh, she just uh, stomped her foot down, got real Texas and uh, settled in and uh, just hit her groove and went right for it. And when she came off stage, uh, she was crying. She couldn't believe that she'd gone over so well that it was uh, such an you know, emotional experience for her. And that was just the beginning of, uh, they, you know, as I was saying, the idea was to put these acts in place and then get a lot of new acts that no one had ever heard of before who were great musicians uh, and uh, give them a chance uh, to perform in front of all these people under the auspices of the established acts, you know. And uh, that's what made it work, I think, really. If you see Monterey Pop and then play Woodstock right afterwards, uh, you see two different, it's like two different tribes almost of people, uh, even though a lot of the same people attended. In that 18-month period between the two shows, the climate of the, of, of the political climate, uh, the cheerfulness of the people, the unity, everything sort of changed into uh, open warfare more than uh, peace and love. This was really the end of the flower power era. 
and, and so, so sort of the beginning of the me generation coming on. It was a, it was a, a definite uh, stop right there. Woodstock uh, was had so much money behind it, and was so publicized, and, and uh, you know the movie was uh, widely distributed by a major company, and uh, we kept ours on a very organic level. I mean, we weren't after that. That wasn't, you know, after fame and fortune. You know, Woodstock was done on a profit basis. Uh, I was asked to be on the board of directors of Woodstock, as a matter of fact, and. Uh, when they told me they were, you know, I would get a certain percentage of this and that and that, I said, oh, just forget it, you know. So, it's not, this isn't something I even want to be a part of. So I think that uh, they did it on a much more commercial basis, you know, and uh, uh, with, uh, you know, really paid PR people and heavy hitters, you know, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but I think that, uh, like Cass once told me, she said, uh, well, maybe Woodstock will make the money, but Monterey will have the legend. We had just recorded uh, our third album, and uh, uh, we were on a concert. We were had pl I canceled a concert tour, and spent most of my time uh, giving speeches to uh, citizens of Monterey, the women's clubs, and uh, the Kiwanis, and the Lions, and the Elks, and the Eagles, to convince them to give us the city permits. You know, and talking to the police chiefs, and so I, I finally decided that the best way was to give everybody in Monterey a job. <laughs> just to hire the entire town almost, you know, in some capacity, one way or another. <laughs> you know, everybody who was out of work in Monterey, I gave them a job. <laughs> uh, every cop in Monterey worked, uh, every uh, sanitation worker worked, everybody who worked for the city and, uh, and, and who was in indigent uh, got a chance to work for, you know, a couple of months on, on this project. I must have gone up there just for that purpose, you know, to talk to officials and, and to uh, citizens groups and things like that at least ten times during that three months period and, uh, you know, spoke at luncheons and things like that and had to wear a suit and, you know, it's like really uh, a salesmanship job, but it's something I really believed in. I didn't think I was like, uh, you know, BSing them. I felt like I was really telling them the truth that this was going to work and it was going to be a good thing and uh, they exhausted themselves. I mean, they really did. Uh, they went far above and beyond the call of duty as citizens of Monterey to welcome these people. And uh, only a town like Monterey could probably do it, you know, what, that was so kicked back to start with. And uh, they really got into the spirit of things. Um, I mean, the, uh, Kim Novak was backstage serving things behind the buffet, you know, <laughs> things like that, you know. Uh, uh, Doris Day was there, you know, helping out, you know, <laughs> bandaging up wounds and stuff like that. And, Everyone was equal. It was, it was wonderful. My daughter, China, uh, China Phillips, was conceived during the Monterey Pop Festival, as a matter of fact. And uh, she just finished Caddyshack 2 with Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase. So <laughs> she was uh, under a good auspice, <laughs> I suppose. I think the worst act of uh, the whole Monterey Pop Festival was the Mamas and Papas, because we had no time to rehearse at all. We were also busy, you know, uh, doing the, putting the concrete together, uh, the whole event together, you know. And we, suddenly we remembered that we were supposed to sing also as the closing act. <laughs> it was all completely out of tune. That was amazing. I consider myself to be an old beatnik. Uh, I really grew up in North Beach uh, uh, with the, you know, Kerouac and uh, Ferlinghetti and Ginsburg and people like that, and those were my main influences. Uh, uh, I played the Hungry Eye for years as a, you know, like a house band almost with my group called The Journeyman uh, with Scott McKenzie and Dick Weissman. And we played for Lenny Bruce uh, for months. We were his opening act and for Mort Saul and Shelley Berman and all of these things. And uh, uh, Enrico uh, Banducci and I had like classic fights uh, up and down uh, North Beach and the City Lights bookshop and the Vesuvios and all that stuff. So. And I wrote a lot of songs for the Kingston Trio. I did a lot of their vocal arrangements and things like that. And uh, so that's where my main influences came from, that and, uh, and uh, early jazz, musically. But uh, I really got into, in, into the flower power thing. I really believed in uh, the fact that we could change the world. And uh, we got a good start on it, you know? I mean, uh, I feel a lot of the resurgence of the 80s as a result of the 60s. Farm Aid, Band Aid, uh, all the different relief programs, uh, Amnesty International, things like that. I don't think they would have been possible had not the 60s laid the groundwork for it. 
You know, we had just had no experience in it at all. There was no, nothing to refer to. Even as far as drugs was concerned, I mean, LSD was legal in 64. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Timothy uh, Leary and, uh, uh, and Herb Alpert, no, I'm sorry, Herb, <laughs> and, uh, and Alpert and Leary from uh, Harvard, you know, were saying it's a mind-expanding drug, take it and you'll you know, do this, you know, da 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 And uh, Aldous Huxley was, had written books about it, like Doors of Perception and things like that, you know. And we really just couldn't wait to find it. And so everyone was just, like, taking it like mad. And there was a fellow named Owsley uh, in San Francisco who made a special brand of acid for Monterey called Monterey Purple, which uh, was passed out all over the, the fairgrounds. And uh, no one knew they were really playing Russian roulette with their minds at the time. A lot of people just never came back from uh, their very first trip. And others took thousands of trips and uh, were never affected at all. So you just, it, was, it was a real crapshoot. No one knew, and still the same way, I suppose. Well, I, I, Denny Doherty uh, had been, uh, he sang with the Mamas and Papas, of course, Papa Denny. And uh, he uh, had been in uh, the Bahamas, and uh, he arrived 10 minutes before we went on stage on Sunday night. And he drove up, and he said, it's the weirdest thing. I drove up, and he said, there's this cop standing there with a, a rifle and a flower coming out of the muzzle. He said, what have you guys been doing to these people? <laughs> it was... Uh, it was just cooperation, you know. I mean, they realized that we were there uh, not to make any trouble at all. And uh, uh, the angels uh, kindly offered their services as uh, protectors, you know, which we kindly refused because uh, we didn't think it would be necessary really to have uh, minders there, you know, to keep the crowd in control. The only problem we really had was one time uh, when Otis was singing, I think he was doing Try a Little Tenderness or something like that. People were out of their seats and standing on their seats and screaming and dancing in the aisles and all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, the uh, police chief came up to me and he said, if you don't get them back in their seats within the next five minutes, he said, uh, I'm pulling the plug on the whole event. And uh, I said, oh, you can't do that. We've <laughs> worked all these months, you know. So uh, I called Otis over. I was behind the drum stand. And I said, Otis, I said, you've got to get the people back in their seats again or else they're going to pull the plug on the whole event. So and I would have gone out and said, now the police have come and they've said they're going to pull the plug on the whole event if you don't want to back in there. And I always went out and said, this is the love crowd, right? And everybody said, right, right. He says, okay, then love yourself enough to sit down, all right? <laughs> and so everyone sat back down again and uh, everything was fine. He just went on. But he did it in his own way, you know, which was so smooth and you know, so opposite the way I would have done it. I was, got my total respect immediately. I was having such a hard time selling the idea to the community and because uh, they were so frightened of all these people descending upon them, you know. So uh, Scott McKenzie was actually the inspiration for it, the fellow who actually sang it, um, who's in The Mamas and Papas Now. I've known Scott since we were teenagers and uh, he came to my house one afternoon and he said, uh, you know what you ought to do uh, is uh, go to your strength, you know, and uh, write a, a song that expresses uh, to people around the country who are coming to San Francisco for this, for this festival that uh, to come with that spirit in their mind, you know, of wearing flowers in their hair and like a uh, very Grecian Olympiad kind of thing, you know, but a meeting of uh, nations and people and, uh, you know, in peace, love and unity, that kind of thing. And uh, so the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, wear flowers in your hair. And uh, so I just sat down and wrote the song in about 20 minutes. and. Uh, we recorded it that week, and uh, it came out on the weekend, and I think by the next week it was number one all over the world or something, you know, it was just crazy the way it went. Well, I got a couple of guys from my hometown <laughs> in Alexandria, Virginia, from a group called the Delray Locals, a uh, gang I belonged to when I was a kid. One guy who was, uh, who's now fire chief of, uh, uh, no, fire inspector, it's a better job even, <laughs> of, uh, of Alexandria, Virginia. His name is Jimmy Short. And uh, Jimmy was like, sort of took care of the office area, you know. So I, I said, uh, now, Jimmy, I don't want anybody to come through here without a pass. He says, don't worry, John. No one's coming through here without a pass, you know. So uh, I came out about 10 minutes later, and there's about five guys laid out on the ground, you know. And I said, what happened to these guys, Jimmy? He said, they tried to come through without a pass, John. I said, it wasn't quite what I meant, Jim. <laughs> Explain to him I didn't want anybody hurt, you know. Just say no. <laughs> he was like decking people, you know. <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah, we had a, a constant uh, group of uh, security people who were, you know, we had meetings and talks with them, you know, about uh, uh, nonviolent techniques of crowd control, you know, and how to like talk to people, you know, and not uh, handcuff them and things like that, you know. I think it changed a lot of things. I think it changed a lot of people's attitudes uh, toward music. Uh, it, uh, it gave the world a, an opportunity to, uh, to hear just uh, what was here on this planet and uh, for people to hear the different kinds of music and the different influences from uh, different countries. Uh, it's just a shame that we couldn't have gone a whole week and uh, included uh, another 100 acts, you know, because the talent was there. The, the time factor just wasn't, you know, and the, and the wear and tear on the human body and mind. Uh, you needed uh, three John Phillipses and three Lou Adlers and three, uh, you know, of everything, you know, to, to get it done.